are listening to WHOA Podcast, coming to you from Gainesville, Florida. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the WHOA GNV Podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa! My name is Colin Austin, and my co-host is an icy cup of cold brew in a world of pumpkin spice lattes, the one, the only, Michael D. Is, is icy being a good thing, or? Uh, in, in, a world of, in a world of pumpkin lattes, I don't know if icy, icy is a good is thing. Good? I thought you would like to be cold brew in a world of pumpkin lattes. I mean, you're, you're right, I would like to be cold brew, but, I don't, yeah. but icy? Uh. The copywriter is killing it, <laughs> She loves to give she me shade, like, though. She is killing it. That's why it. I just like, eh. Dude, what's know. up, man? How, How are, are you? you? I'm, I'm a little sore this morning. Why? I mean, I go to the, so I go to the gym 605 every morning, and Tuesdays when That's we record. That's your first mistake. That's my first mistake. Tuesdays when we record, like I'm literally rushing over here. And uh, yeah, no, I had an intense weightlifting session this morning. So I'm okay. like a little, uh, a little stretch, sore. Stretch yeah. it out, yeah, man. But, stretch but I'm okay out. other than that. How are you? Good, man. I mean, we're rolling into like season now. I mean, you know, into like holiday season. Holiday season. We're right. getting pretty close. You know, today is November 18th. Thanksgiving Episode up. number 80. 80. That's crazy. 80. We did it. 80. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'm like looking forward to episode 100. It's like 20 episodes away. I have to do something super special. I don't know what it's going like to be. Like a balloon drop or something. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. But so, I mean, you got any plans for holidays coming up? Anything you're doing? What, is, actually, what does a CEO do? Yeah, so I usually... I usually take a little time away. Uh, That's your second mistake dude. for holiday, right? So, <laughs> so you ask if I have any plans. I've actually like refrained from making plans so far this year because I feel like I've got a lot of uh, a lot of work to do. Maybe more so than usual uh, in the the times that we close this year. So, uh, I haven't made any plans. I might have to postpone my uh, winter what I normally do for winter break to like February or something, depending on how all that goes. But yeah. a lot a lot of work to do uh, in the next coming months. Cool man. Uh, well, I mean, it's like it's you gotta gotta get refocused now. I mean, I'm I'm already looking at 2020 and all the things we oh, got to do. It's like so yeah. much to do just to prep for the year ahead. You know, there's always we got, we got camera batteries dying. What does that mean? I have no idea. <laughs> Smoke alarm. Hold on, you guys. Everybody, <laughs> pause. We got beeping in the house. No, we're good, right? Yeah, I can. That's you. Yeah. Hi, right, you guys. Right, so we got a special good. guest in the house today. <laughs> His name's Mike Reno. We're gonna let the we're gonna let the little beeping, you know, pass. My no, it's just uh, oh, gotcha. No, it's it's fine. I just want to make sure we didn't have cameras dying. That would be, <laughs> I mean, based Get. off the equipment failures I've already had this morning, that would actually be something that would happen. You did press record, but, right? Yes, I did. Okay, good. That, that's definitely the good thing. <laughs> so, uh, hey, it's happened, it's happened before. It's happened before. Um, <laughs> But Mike, thanks for bringing the coffee and donuts, man. You're welcome. Appreciate oh, yeah. it. You guys, we got a special uh, guest in house, which sometimes we let people come and they like see it live. And I mean, it's a little tight in here, right, with all the equipment, but we make it work. It's beautiful. It's, it's good. It's good. Thank you. So no, man. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And um, dude, so you know, Opus Coffee has been a sponsor for several episodes, mm -hmm. right? Did you? But they just, of course, they would do this after their sponsorship is technically like passed. But have you seen this Airstream? You showed it to me the other day and I was blown away. That thing is so cool. Have you guys seen this? Yeah. Okay. I haven't. All right. So like Tim and Brett basically <laughs> created a coffee shop inside of an Airstream. Right. <laughs> and I think they're keeping it out there Fourth Avenue Food Park. <laughs> but I cannot Smart. wait to see it. I haven't seen it yet. I can't wait to see it Yeah, though. just some photos, but yeah. I'm a sucker for an Airstream anyway. Ever since I was a little kid, but I always like really wanted one, and then when you showed me that picture the other day, they have it all like uh, renovated inside to be this like pop-up coffee shop. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. And converting the inside yeah. to be a coffee shop. That's, dude, you're right, it's so cool. It's, it's pretty cool. I can't, I can't, well, I well can't, done, Opus. can't wait to visit. But, and um, so we have other, actually will you unplug that device real quick? I can because otherwise I'm gonna start saying her name and she's going to start freaking out. Just pull it, can you or no? There you go. Uh, so you guys, I wanna, so you know, we've had the Alexa flash briefing, right? Which is like super awesome because you can like basically wake up and say, Alexa, start my day. And if you have the flash briefing, then Alexa will play like a small clip of the podcast, right? From a previous episode. But now, if you like listening to stuff on Alexa, we actually have the WHOA GNV skill, right? So what you can do is open, you can go to your skills in your Alexa device, you can search WHOA GNV podcast, 
and then you can basically just activate the skill and then you can say, Alexa, open WHOA podcast and she will start playing the entire episode. That's, what a time to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd be like, Alexa, play WHO or open WHOA podcast and she'll play it. So definitely go download our Alexa skill if you like to listen to, you know, to your podcast while you're getting ready in the morning or whatever you want to do, man. Yeah. I mean, I, ha- you know, I have all I have Alexa devices in every room in my house, so I could. Tell that you, does not I surprise could, me. I could definitely say play play the podcast everywhere, and then she would like play it on all of them at the same time. And it's great because I can yell at my kids all the way to the bedroom, but <laughs> like because they're on the complete other side of the house, and if they're not, if I can hear them talking or whatever, I'd be like Alexa, drop in on the boys' room. And she'll do that, and I can say, boys, do not make me come back there. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you make Schaefer listen to the podcast? Do you, like, uh, taking notes? He, he, I mean, I wish he would, but, like, uh, he's... He's focused he's, on soccer. Yeah, he's not <laughs> there yet. So, anyway, we're about to move into our show, but before we do, uh, we have a nonprofit shout-out of the day, just to give a heads-up to everybody for a really cool happen for a really cool event happening in early December. It's called Pay to Spay, and, Mike, I'll let you hit the bullet points. Oh, Tell cool. everybody about it. Pay to Spay. This is like a, a Bob Barker thing, right? Uh, <laughs> nonprofit that funds spay and neuter surgeries for pet owners that can uh, cannot afford it to reduce, if not eliminate, euthanasia of healthy animals as population control. Uh, pay to Spay is having a fundraiser on Saturday, December 7th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's a champagne brunch with raffles, silent auction, pup-up gift shop. I love the pun there. Pup-up gift shop. <laughs> you're, you're such a pun. Uh, man. I know. And more. For more info on how to be a sponsor or vendor, contact Eve Crispin at pay to spay at gmail.com. That's P-A-Y-T-O-S-P-A-Y at gmail.com. Great, great event. Great fundraiser for a good cause. Boom. I'm excited. Are you ready to excited for today? You're always pumped. I mean, it's your, it's your favorite, favorite time of the, the week. You know, I, it was funny because... Uh, I, I looked back at the picture though when we did the morning podcast with uh, with Olga, mm-hmm. right? I'm like looking at my face in the picture. I'm like, dude, I look so tired in the picture. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'll be honest, I de- I definitely prefer the like evening recordings, but you know, like sleep is a good thing, Colin. It, it's the schedule, man. You got to go with the schedule, and it's sometimes during the morning, sometimes during the night, but. I just, I definitely need to get more sleep. Yeah, that's always true. Yeah, so we're working on it. But you guys, <laughs> get ready. Today on the show, we have Kevin Spellacy, who is the president and mechanical engineer at Campbell Spellacy Engineering. And with him, we have Jose Alzate. Is that right? That's close enough. Close right, enough right? Dude, I told him, I told, <laughs> him, I told, him, I told him I was gonna go for it. You went for go, it. You say it. <laughs> Alzate. Yeah, you're not gonna. I get like the put more like yeah, a po- it. yeah. It sounds way sexier when you use it. <laughs> <laughs> Who is an electrical designer and project manager with the firm? So, guys, welcome to our show. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having us. So, we like to start with everybody's story. Well, real, real, real quick, <laughs> before we even do that, I don't know if you know this, but on episode, I went back to look up the episode number, but episode forty-one. Whitney actually came in, Kevin's wife, mm-hmm. came in and sat as my co-host when, when she was here representing Junior League of Gainesville. So, I mean, it's, uh, that's like 40 episodes ago. Right. right? Like mm. 40, I mean, that's a long time ago. Yeah. So She gave me zero pointers. Yeah, zero, <laughs> zero pointers. She was no help at all, right? So I just wanted to give a little shout out to Whitney. Mm-hmm. Because uh, she did excellently right. as my co-host right. that day. So no pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you really have to like live up to yeah, that. Yeah, co-host might have been a better role for me. <laughs> Let Jose talk. So, well, let's get into it, man. You guys, tell me, tell me your story. Tell me how you started this awesome firm, and we'll take it from there. So I actually did not start it. Uh, I inherited it from a uh, business partner of mine in 2014. So I've been with the firm since I was a sophomore in college at UF. Uh, I started basically doing hourly drafting with them because I had a background in that from high school. Uh, my business partner was was looking to retire fairly soon, so he and I basically worked out a plan for uh, you know kind of a phase transition. So in 2014, I took over. Um, we changed the name to Campbell Spellacy. It used to be Campbell Engineering in North Florida. 2014, we partnered, and then in 2016, he retired fully, and I took over as president. So it's been a, uh, a, this was our fifth year, I think, with the name change, and we just actually underwent a rebrand and kind of are changing a little bit more and, and changing our focus more than anything. The name is not changing, but we have a new logo and some new core values and some a little different focus on, on how we approach what we do. 
but it's been a uh, it's been five years of kind of incremental change and, and modernization of the firm and a lot of new people, a lot of new faces, and growing a little bit since then. So it's it's been a uh, it's been a process. Cool. So I mean, did you always want to be a mechanical engineer? Like, for take, take us back before you even got into the company, I guess. So I've always been very good at math and never really enjoyed it. I was just very good at it. Um, in high school, I got into a mechanical drafting program, which is a little, you know essentially hand drawing, 3D models, getting into AutoCAD, and things like that. And that's when I really, really embraced kind of the the fun of it. And I had actually had a mechanical engineer who does what I do now as my drafting teacher in high school. He was a retired mechanical engineer and really gave me the leeway and, and basically gave me carte blanche of a curriculum to just invent my own curriculum, which is the craziest thing I've ever seen, but worked great for me and really inspired me to, to keep uh, kind of the creative side of engineering, which I really kind of dug into. But mechanical engineering in school is, you know, robotics and aerospace, and they want you building planes and jet engines, but I was never really exposed, and I still think the, the current class is not really exposed to what we do on a daily basis, but this, the, the time I graduated, I think the statistic was something like 60% of engineers go into some form of consulting, and the other 40% go into kind of the primary focus of the curriculum. So when I kind of on a whim answered a, an ad to start drafting for this company, I had no idea what you know HVAC was. You know, we we kind of learned the principles of it, but they never really apply it to what we do on a daily basis. A lot of the applications and your test problems are related to aerospace and you know astronomy, sort of physics. But what we do is you know using a lot of the same physics, but in a much more physical and kind of tangible application that everybody sees every day. But it, it goes under the radar a lot. So I. My, my business partner at the time had asked me probably 15 times, about every six months he would ask me, you know, there's an opportunity here, you know, do you want a partner? Do you want to, you know, eventually take this thing over? And I told him no shortage of probably 20 times that it was not for me. I did not like the, the work, it, it was boring, it, you know, it just, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to go build robots or do manufacturing or do something else. And I told him at least a dozen times that I wasn't gonna do it and that I was gonna leave town and eventually, the more responsibility I got and the more involved I got with the projects, the more I kind of embraced what was unique about it and what I really was good at. So in about 2012, we, I kind of made the leap where I was gonna stay and, and really get into it. So I've, I've learned to love what we do now. It's I don't think I could be doing anything else. How long had you been there before that opportunity came up or before they even presented it to you? Probably about opp- five years okay. before we really started talking in earnest about it. Okay, so um, I'm definitely one of those people when it comes to like engineering, and <laughs> you're gonna have to dumb it down Your to like, <laughs> over, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to like dumb it down to like a second see, grade. I level. think that's what makes our company different. You know, we, as Kevin was just stating, we are going into a rebranding, and we're all in on reimagining the engineer. Um, you know, being different, seeing what. Um, the, the everybody you know has kind of like that similar first impression you know engineer gloss over you know kind of boring and we're really focusing on kind of changing that perception all right so when somebody does ask you the question what do you do on a daily basis yeah that was <laughs> what's the answer <laughs> one of the biggest surprises i had was when we first started going to chamber events and we did some of the breakfast before hours and things like that and you realize that nobody understands what we do. They don't even know that it's an industry, let alone you know the details of what we do. But uh, the way I, I like to describe it to people is everybody knows what an architect does. They design the building, they make sure that it works, they make it pretty. When somebody designs a new building, the architect handles the roof, walls, windows, floors, everything inside of the, or that makes the building itself. Everything else that makes the building work is by us. Uh, we do the lighting, HVAC, We do data communications, we do power, everything else, the plumbing systems. So all the systems that that are inside of those walls, roof, windows are designed by a company like us. So we take, you know, pretty good amount of math and basically customize equipment sizing and piping runs, duct runs, things like that. All of those systems have to be sized, selected. We'll take, you know, dozens of products made by different manufacturers and assemble them into kind of a cohesive system that meets whatever application the building needs. So every building's a little bit different. You're gonna have different numbers of people, different loads inside. You know, this studio is gonna be different from a single person office. So 
a lot of people take for granted that if you have a 2,000 square foot house, you're gonna get a four-tone air conditioning system. Mm -hmm. And when you get into specific applications, like a, a big 20,000 square foot office or a museum or something like that, it's just, it's not that simple. There's hundreds of different types of air conditioning, let alone sizes and combinations of options, things like that. So that's when we get to have fun, is when we, we get one of those unique applications. I'm reflecting back to when we actually built this office. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? We built this office and we had to install air conditioning on this side of the building. Right. And it wasn't even like, it was It was either hot, like it was so hot, right? Right. It wasn't, it we, wasn't, we an, weren't getting air yeah, in here. We had to get a, another We had like unit. two vents yeah. and they had to come back and put in like a third what? vent or that's, something. Like, that's what we do somebody, all day. Somebody did the bath wrong. Yeah. <laughs> somebody call Kevin, get him in here. <laughs> what happened is somebody dropped a wall right here that wasn't supposed to be here. Yeah. Right. That's, that's that usually was, what. That was so, me. Yeah, I, that's me being yeah. like, you know what I want? I want a big glass wall yeah. right here. It's great. Like right here. It looks amazing. So how critical does that make you? Like when you come to a place like this anywhere do you like find yourself just looking around man like it's usually Ooh. up we look yeah. up okay every i look at the lights every, everywhere you go like <laughs> yeah. so you never really rely like you're just constantly like you're just like who did so, yes. so when you're networking you know i always talk about when people are networking and they're like glancing over shoulders because they're not really interested in what you're saying they're looking at the next prospects <laughs> they're like but you guys you're not doing this right like yes. looking up looking up at the sky instead. it's happened several times where you're we'll like, be in a, a somebody speaking or something and i'll hear the air conditioning start on the, the roof home. at like a hotel conference center and I'm bothered by it the rest of the talk. And I just, I need to fix it. So that's usually the distraction. That's it's, funny to this me. This could be better. God, yeah, for me, I'm on the electrical side. So I, I look at the lights and I'm like, oh, the color temperature is not the same in these lights. Yeah. I you mean, know, we got... do it too. That's so funny though. Cause you know, we do it too. We'll be sitting at like the small restaurant out in the, out on the porch. And then all of a sudden, you know, you hear ring, like <laughs> go by and I'm like, oh, scooter. Like, you know, my head instantly pops up from hearing a scooter and I'm like instantly looking to see, well, one, is it one of Ours. Right, like, right, right, right. Is that one of our scooters that just went by? So I mean, that person needs a new muffler. <laughs> <laughs> Get that guy an exhaust gasket now. Uh, yeah, that's that's funny. That, mm -hmm. I could totally see that happening. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite debilitating yet, but it's, I was gonna say, does it America. drive you crazy that you can't ever just like not let always? It be? Yeah, it's it's like having that uh, kind of that sixth sense that you you want to just inform everybody that this could be a whole lot. Better. It's a conversation starter. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a lead generation. <laughs> that's <laughs> like, funny. It's interesting. Yeah. All right, so Jose, you've been there how long? So I've been there since 2013. I started as an intern. Um, so this was before you even became yeah, president? Jose, Jose okay. started yeah. before I Okay, partnered. wow, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, so I, I was there, so I was actually hired by Art, which is the um, president of the company before Kevin. And yeah, so I am from South Florida. Uh, I came here for school. It took me a very long time to get through electrical engineering. That's a whole different story. <laughs> uh, and I, I interned with uh, Campbell Spellacy, or I guess at the time, uh, uh, Campbell Engineering of North Florida. And yeah, it was it was a, a great experience, but similar to Kevin, I'm like, you know, this is not what I wanna do uh, for the rest of my life. I want to, yeah, you know, in my head I was like, oh, I'm gonna move to a big city and I'm gonna do, uh, I was always passionate about roller coasters, so that's how I even got into engineering in the first place. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I wanna do. You know, you have this dream of going to Disney and designing roller coasters. But that dream quickly died when I realized that you had to be a mechanical engineer, really, <laughs> and I'm not very mechanically inclined. So I chose the electrical engineering path, and similar to Kevin, like once you start getting more responsibility, when you get time with clients, when you're um, designing, it's it's uh, it's something very different than uh, anything else that I had done at the time. And so I really enjoy being with the clients and then seeing the project finish, and that's what kept me. Cool. I'm fascinated by like the the disappointment of being good at something you don't necessarily love. Um, did did you like prepare yourself for the mentality that like, hey, this is gonna be my reality. I just you know, I'm I'm gonna settle professionally. Or did you did you think that there was a chance that you would learn to love it? So for me, it was never settling. It was. You know, you have an idea. So in my particular case, it was roller coasters, but then, you know, the design and, and having that interaction with the client was almost like the same thrill that I would have imagined that I was getting if I were designing the roller coasters. So I don't think that I ever settled. I think that it was always, you know, it was a shift of what excited me. The same for you, right? Yeah, I think it's just, a, it's it's focusing on, on kind of the specifics of it versus 
looking at it from a thousand feet. Um, you know, when you first get into it and you don't really understand all the nuts and bolts, it's a lot of just repeating what somebody told you to do. And when you get kind of over the hump where you're the one saying what's going to happen and you're making those design decisions, it, it gives you that sense of kind of creativity that transfers you beyond kind of just the, the nuts and bolts math of it to decision making. And that's when you really kind of get that, Jose and I were talking about this yesterday, you get kind of in that flow mentality where when you're really designing something, everything's kind of coming together. It's like, it's like completing a puzzle. It's very rewarding when you get that nice one elegant solution. So it really is a matter of the, the deeper you get into it, the more uh, kind of reward you can find in it. So it's not really that, you know, what I thought I was going to be doing is not what I ended up doing. Mm. So we've, we've kind of shifted the focus of, of what, what it is that we do that we're, we're taking pride in. So it's not just the repetition and the, the boring parts of it that, that anybody can do, and, and every job's basically the same. You know, we have all the same components, but focusing on that um, kind of the process of the design that's really rewarding. Yeah, a, a big shift that we've had lately is really focusing on kind of not just that we're building or designing a building, it's, it's what does that building allow our client to do? So we're, we're making kind of an intentional focus on the impact of our projects over just the project itself. So, you know, our typical project, we're a small firm, so we're going to do smaller projects that aren't going to make it in the paper. You know, nobody's going to put us in a magazine or a case study, but even the smallest projects we have can... can How about a podcast? We'll put you... <laughs> <laughs> I think this counts. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we'll, this we'll, is, put, you, we'll put you on a podcast, This is great. <laughs> <laughs> but even, you know, we do projects where the entire budget was $1,000, and that had an impact on somebody. Somebody needed that to happen, so if we can do that and do it the same way that we would approach a million dollar project, that's that's kind of where the magic is for us. So there's 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 an opportunity there to have impact, and if we focus on that, I think we can find a lot more reward in what we do than just focusing on what makes it the same as the last project we had. So it's just a, sh- a shift in focus, I would say. Yeah, especially because a lot of times when we go to those initial meetings, um, they'll tell us what isn't working for them at that moment. So it's kind of common for somebody to say, yeah, you know, like I'm always cold in my office. And it's something that, you know, they're, they're thinking about, you know, it's every day they're going to their office and they're cold, they're not happy. You know, the lighting level is not what they want it to be. And then we come in and then we improve that person's life. You know, it's minuscule mm-hmm. in the grand scheme of things. But you know that's that's where we're at. We're thinking about um, the end user, the person that's sitting in their office, and how can we improve their life. I think it's funny because like I don't know. It's almost like as a consumer, you become used to your misery. Like I sit here and somebody's either cold or somebody's hot, and you're just like, that's just the way it is. You don't think about there's there's actually people that doesn't have, have firms like that. that exactly like that. That's that's your job is to make you not miserable. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. that's really interesting because like you know you always get I mean it's one thing to have like a thermostat war or something but it's another thing to just have like an office that's prone to be too cold. The solution is two thermostats. Yeah, yeah. you can make that happen. It's awesome. So I'm really like fascinated by by the transition a little bit. So you said that was 2014. 14, yeah. Okay, and you were with the firm since 2013. Yeah. So is that like going from coworker to boss? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Okay, so what? <laughs> but I, I wasn't at the office very often because I was, you know, an intern. Okay. So he was still, you know, elevated in, in my eyes. Right? All right. So he was already. Like... Yeah. <laughs> and he was being groomed, you know. So <laughs> okay. It, so it was still, you know, there was still obviously that respect, and, and uh, but he. So it was an easy transition. It was an easy transition, but you know, he's the type of leader in our office that you know he he doesn't make you feel like he's the boss, and you know this is how you have to do things and if you don't do it you know you're gonna get fired there's, there's never like that fear if anything he he's a, a great leader because he gives everybody else leadership positions right and so you are invested you're invested now in the outcome of this uh, project and the outcome of the company you you, you might not have uh, economic stake in it but you have invested your time and energy into this project into this company and you want it to succeed Keep doing a good job, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the hardest part of that transition for you whenever you ascended into that you know, pre- president role? Like, I mean, was it was it hard for you? I mean, was there something that sticks out as like the hardest part of that transition? Business. Uh, engineering school has no business training mm-hmm. whatsoever. Um, and 
there, there is now, there's actually, there's some minor programs and some other things that, uh, some entrepreneurship type programs within the College of Engineering, which I think are fantastic. But at the time I did not take, you know, I had no idea of people management, HR, any of the stuff that comes with this. And our company at the time, because we've always been small and we were only about 15 years old at the time and always had just kind of, you know, three or four employees, we didn't have an employee manual. We didn't have policies. Mm-hmm. We didn't have core values, mission statement, anything like that. So the first year was basically just holding on and trying to make payroll. The second year really is when I dug in and started trying to learn everything that I possibly could. That's when I got involved with Chamber and, and some of the networking relationships there. I read every book I can get my hands on basically, but learning that side of it, especially the people management has been Number one, it was the hardest challenge, but now it's one of the, my favorite things to do. It's it's what I spend most of my time. How big is the team now? Uh, we're at seven okay. right now. So was there was there any like kickback whenever you started to kind of employ uh, employ these things like core values and stuff like that? Where people like that's not the way we do this. I mean, was there any? Not kind of- as much. We right now we have uh, Jose and our office manager, the only two from when I first took over. We had some turnover, and I've hired the other four of us now. Um, and a lot of that, they, they kind of came in once we had already established that. Jose and, and my office manager, Amy, were, were the two that kind of, we kind of worked as a group on that and, and implemented those things, not top down, but as, what do you guys think about this? And, and we, we worked uh, in this rebrand that we've just got done with. Um, Jose and Diego and Amy in our office, we all basically did the rebrand together. We worked on the core values, we did the mission statement. That was a group effort so that it's not just me saying this is where we're going, this is where do we right. want to go and how are we going to get there. So it was more collaborative, which I think helps with the buy-in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think if it comes just from me, and, and part of it is that you know it doesn't. it's not just me that has to abide by these things. I know where I want to be, but let's figure out as a group how we get there. And, and what we want to focus on. So I think what we ended up with is, is really easy to buy into because it's it's basically just a formalization of the How way we that we've doing always everything. done right. it. My old business partner, Art, was just an old school way of doing things, just did business the right way. And you know, his we never marketed, I don't think he's ever even spent a dollar on marketing because he never had to. He had amazing word of mouth, he had great relationships with clients and everybody loved working with him. So he never really formalized what that is and how that works when you start scaling up employees and how do we make sure the guy that's been here for three months does it the way that Jose's been doing it for seven years. So a lot that's been the challenge is, is institutionalizing the way that art used to do business, which is not very common anymore. So going back to the core values, I mean, you guys sat down and created these core values. I mean, what was what was your process? Because I think that'd be a super valuable thing for our audience, right? Is like what steps that they should take when actually trying to create a set of core values for their team. So I, I was fortunate enough to have worked with Crosslinear about two years ago before the rebrand idea, but when we were first creating our core values, because we had this, you know, we were starting from zero. Um, I worked with them and, you know, the, the sticky note approach and the, 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 the standard process for kind of narrowing down what your, what your values are as a kind of a leader and then what, how you would describe what you do. Um, that narrowed it down to five core values at the time that are pretty close actually to what we organically came up with as a group. Um, but the focus was really on how we interact with our clients over the actual project design. So we, we really got above kind of the engineering side and it was all about customer, all about client interactions. So the, the values that we ended up with, I think reflect that fairly well, that we're not really focused on, you know, we made a decision fairly early on that we are not going to try to do $10 million jobs. That's not who we are. It's not, it's not where I don't want to have a 50 person firm and, and have to manage that many people. and and you know, be that firm, I wanna be the best 10 person firm that we can be. And I wanna be able to handle every project like it's a $10 million job, but be able to help these clients that have you know, a $1,000 project here and can't get somebody to return their phone call. So the focus has always been on, we don't wanna be the biggest, but we wanna do every job as well as we can and treat every client right. So that, that really informed the process that we were working on. Yeah, like our first value that we came up with organically was advocacy. You know, we're going to be an advocate for you, you being the client, you being the architect, because a lot of times we're hired by the architect, um, you being the contractor, whatever the case uh, may be, but we're going to be your advocate. We're going to be there um, helping you 
throughout the process because the process can be very overwhelming, especially, yeah. you know, most people, um, you know, if you're gonna build a house, which is, we're not in residential, but you know, it, it can translate into this. Um, if you're gonna build a house, you're gonna do it once, most likely, and you need someone there throughout the way to help you and that's who we are yeah We're most, be your most people aren't building you know 20 buildings a year and understand the process and understand what all these terms mean and you know what we found is a lot of the kind of the hesitation on our client side is just lack of information there's a there's a just um, imbalance we know what we're talking about but they don't understand it well enough and there's a discomfort there so a lot of what we focused on now is really educating not just you know our clients but everybody on what we do how these systems work because the more comfortable and the more understanding they are and most people can understand it it's not overly complicated but the more that they understand what we intend to do how this is going to impact them what it's going to look like when we're done the more comfortable and kind of the more peace of mind everybody has so we that's that's kind of where that came from is, is we think the more we inform and educate the the happier everybody will be what is that education like like what do you guys do to a lot like this, you know, we we first have to explain what we do and why we why we even exist. A lot of people just you can assume, just start forwarding this podcast episode to people. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, you know, most people don't understand. And when I say that we design air conditioning systems, that's a, just a foreign concept. What, what do you you know What do you have to design? Just go to Home Depot and buy one, mm-hmm. and then have a contract to put it in. Um, so informing people just what the options are and, and what our process looks like and what we have to, what decisions have to be made, what answers we need from them, and not just asking them questions you know, out of the blue, but un- informing them why it matters. And the more we can involve them in the process and make them stakeholders, the, the less chance there is that they're gonna be surprised at the end. You know, there's a big movement right now within our industry to move towards um, 3D modeling and, and a lot of renderings and things like that on the architectural side because a client can see exactly what their building's gonna look like. We kind of have to do that on the system side and explain to them maybe not what it's gonna look like, but how is this gonna feel? What is it, you know, your thermostat's gonna be over here. This, this room's gonna be on its own. This one's gonna be on a different one. Here's how your lighting controls are gonna work. Here's what you're gonna be able to do with it. Here's what you're not gonna be able to do with it, but we can do this if you wanna spend more. So informing everybody and making sure everybody has that transparency and, and the ability to make informed decisions throughout the process helps us because they don't come back and wonder what happened at the end. So we found it's, it's mutually beneficial. So how are you making your money? Is it off the consultancy part? I mean, like I'm, I'm thinking the process, right? Okay, if I needed an AC in, in you know this building that I'm designing, I'm like, are you guys actually subcontracting the work out to the air conditioning people, or are you just doing the design part and like, this hand- is what you need, yeah. and 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 you get paid a, a consultancy fee? Is that yeah? So we work right. on design fees. So we typically will work either directly for a client. I'm asking. Uh, look, I'm asking the second grade questions for hey. everybody who's listening. I just <laughs> want to make sure that everybody's. <laughs> perfectly clear on that <laughs> this is day, day one of new employees I have to explain how this works because yeah. it's not so the traditional model is you have a design team and then you have a contracting team okay so the design teams usually let's say it's a new office building you would have an architect usually would be the prime contact for the owner because they're involved with kind of conceptual sketches they start earlier than anybody else so they start laying out what the building might look like how big it is what rooms you're gonna need they're gonna be involved with the client pretty early and that's usually a direct contract between the architect and the client. The architect then would subconsult any other uh, disciplines that they would need. So structural engineering, civil engineering, landscape architecture, MEP, which is what we call ourselves, all of those would work for the architect under gotcha. that one contract. So like clients aren't directly coming to you, it's Correct. usually coming from the architect. Yeah. Correct. Typically, most new construction is going to come through an architect. A lot of the work we do is kind of institutional with uh, University of Florida school board, things like that with contracts okay. where when they have maintenance type projects where they have systems that are failing, they just need to replace that system and there is no architectural component, then they would contract directly with us. Okay. And one thing we've, we've kind of prided ourselves on lately is that we're being hired more often as the prime and subcontracting the architecture, which is, is a shift that's a little difficult to get used to and, and involves more management on our side, but it's hopefully pointing to the right direction that we're treating our clients well and they want to work with us directly. Uh, we also work with a lot of contractors. Um, sometimes the owner will contract the installing contractor directly, but they still need the engineering support to design what the owner is asking, asking them to put in. There's some statutory requirements that have systems of a certain size and complexity have to be engineered by a professional engineer. We're licensed by the state. 
And if that comes up, the contractors oftentimes will just hire us to do the design under their contract. So we've got any number of ways that we can contra- uh, kind of get paid, but it's essentially it's a design fee. So with like a team of seven, like how many projects can you do it? Like what's capacity? We did 81 last year. That, 81, was, our, yeah. that was our most. We've done How about the most at one time? This year. Oh, that's, yeah, it's, at, right now we have either starting design or in construction, we have over 100 okay. right now. So they're all at different phases. Some right. of them are <clears throat> kicking off, some of them are wrapping up, but we have over 100 right now. Because it's not just the design portion, there's also what we call the construction administration part. So we finished the design, but now we're involved while the contractor is doing the installation. Now we get involved to you know answer any questions, everything's gonna look <clears throat> a little bit different from the design documents than in real life. So we're there to like provide assistance to the contractors as well. So, yeah. um, you know, if a question comes up on the field, hey, you know, this looks different in real life than, you know, how you designed it, what should we do? You know, we're there to help. Yeah, it's also um, acting as the owner's advocate again. We're making sure that the contractor's installing what we design and the owner's getting what they paid for essentially. So. Our job is because the owners don't necessarily know what they're looking at and you know can't tell the contractor you're doing that wrong, our job is to make sure they're doing everything right. So even when we're working for the contractor, for the architect, our job is pretty much the same, to make sure everybody's getting what is on the drawings and what they paid for. How much, how much of what you do is for, it sounds like a lot of it's new construction versus fixing problems in buildings that already exist? Actually, probably the vast majority of our work is, is fixing problems. Okay. Yeah, we, do a, uh, we have continuing contracts with the school board and the university, and that's, I would say, about 80% of our work. Most of, we, we basically, we joke in-house that we get called on the, the hardest problems. So it's always, uh, it's a lot of diagnosing. It's something's, like Jose said, they don't really tell you, hey, this, this duct is undersized or this thermostat's in the wrong spot. They'll say, my office is hot. So our job is to translate from that kind of the problem <laughs> That's the scary. to the scope. Mm-hmm. So our, you know, we can take it from that. We know there's a problem, but we don't know what's causing it all the way through. Now we know what's causing it. We know what the solution is. How do we design it to something that somebody can build and put it on paper that a contractor knows exactly what they have to provide? So that's the challenge. You know. so does that just come from lack of foresight whenever the construction happened in the first place, or what, what is the reason that these problems exist? A lot of the problems are just degradation. Equipment okay. only lasts so long, and you know most people will run it to failure. Um, maintenance only goes so far. Even the best equipment's gonna fail after 15, 20 years, and the university builds buildings that last 150. So over time, every 20, 30 years, you're gonna replace everything that you put in, and that's that's a bulk of our work. You know they have thousands of buildings and every year they replace so many systems in it. So we get we get some of that work and more often um, nowadays it's renovations. So there'll be an office suite that hasn't been renovated in 20 years. Everybody that's working there would like it to have new paint, carpet, new furniture, make it look like what the, you know, they're seeing in all the other offices on campus. So <laughs> as soon as the architect comes in and wants to move walls around, change the ceilings around, all of that impacts the stuff that's above the ceilings, which is our world and we have to make it accommodate the renovation. So they may be adding an office, taking a wall out. Every time they do that, like what we're talking about here, if you add this wall, an engineer should tell you what you need to do to make the air conditioning still work after you do that. So if you're gonna add a wall, take a wall out, it impacts the lighting and the air conditioning and everything else. So that's that's more often our role, is figuring out what they're trying to do, how that's gonna impact, and how do we make it still work when we're done. So can we circle back to the core value stuff? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, What are the other four core values? Humility, um, positivity, and growth and service. And service. So they're really new. They are. (laughs) We we, we launched we launched our website first. (laughs) Just just throw it out there. (laughs) I want to see how many hoes they could get. Uh, Yeah, no, no, that's good. So I'm sorry. You said humility. Humility, advocacy positivity, growth, Growth and service. service. So, um, I mean, was the process the same when you're trying to create like the mission statement and like, and the vision for the company, I mean. Yeah, the mission has always, in my mind, been a focus on the client and what the impact is. So right now, our mission statement is is focusing on the impact. Um, In my mind, that's, that's how we motivate internally. It's also how we market externally that, you know, we like the reputation of being the small guy that will take on any size project. That's not, you know, there's a lot of engineering firms here in town and it's not necessarily um, everybody's niche. 
is the small jobs. It's hard work. It's not, it's not any less difficult, but all the margins are smaller. So we take pride in the ability to be profitable even on really small jobs. So, so in formulating like these core values and the mission statement and stuff, I mean, like how long how long was that process? That was a very long process. Yeah, we met. It was a whole summer essentially. Uh, yeah, last okay. summer. Yeah. Um, it, it, I think so. Like the very the what was fun the very first time that we we got together to like brainstorm. We're outside and we're just throwing ideas and we're just like mm-hmm. you know th- this is. You know what defines us. What what do you, why do you like coming to work every day? You know, and then having you know asking each other questions and then picking out you know words and then from those words came like okay well you know we all keep saying like this group of things let's make it into like a core value like this is how um, we all feel you know when we're interacting with clients or when we're at work um, you know whatever the case may be so we start identifying the key uh, kind of group think and then that's where each of the core values came from. Yeah, that's good. I, you know, I was just curious because really uh, the reason I'm asking is because I'm kind of comparing it to the process that we went through. Okay. And and I wanted to see what the similarities were and stuff because we get, I just get, I get asked a lot of times about mm-hmm. our core values and I think, you know, we're pretty well known about for our co- company culture and, you know, so when people ask me those kind of questions, I'm like, well, you know, I mean, our process was a little lengthy. I remember it taking some time and yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like, uh, an overnight thing. I think a lot of people are like, "Oh, I need core values." All right, let me let no. me stay. Let you me pull an all nighter and like yeah. write them all. Yeah. No, <laughs> you, you have to really do a deep dive into your into your company. And you know, one of the things that you know I think wor- really worked well for us is that we got the input from you know it wasn't just Kevin. You know, it was, like he said, it was Diego, it was Amy, it was me. We're all we have different experiences. We have we've come from different backgrounds. Uh, school wise and you know so you see things differently and we're all working we're, we're seven people but we're all um, working in the same thing and you can have a completely different point of view than your your coworker, right yeah so when you're doing the post-it process and you got post-its everywhere I mean how many do you remember how many things you actually kind of came up with I would say we we found a couple of them really early the, the positivity and humility, I think, were two that were huge for us. And that came mainly from client feedback. You know, we, we kind of started with, from a marketing perspective, why do people hire us? And we, we, we hovered around those two pretty early on. The advocacy came later um, as a result of combining probably five or six others mm-hmm. that we started with. Um, service has always been big for me. The, the actual word service took a little while to get to, but um, and then growth growth was really more from a recruitment standpoint. Um, we are fighting for, for talent, everybody is right now. So um, what spun out of that is really kind of a, something that we've, we've built over time now is um, a focus not just on professional development, that's, that's actually required for all of our engineers. Everybody has to do a certain amount of continuing ed, like nursing or doctors. Um, but we're, we're focusing a lot on personal development um, but leadership development, things like that, um, beyond just what we do in engineering, giving people more responsibility, letting them do project management, things like that, um, building those other soft skills that I think would set us apart. So there's there's a benefit to that, but that that came probably last. Um, but that's been that's been one of the more fun things is the people management side of it. Were you there with the, in the process when we did it for? Was, I, I actually came right after it started. Okay. They were installed whenever I I came back. Okay. I just, I remember the process. I mean, we we took everybody out for like a company dinner and got like the big 3M paper and re- just started listening. I'm like, okay guys, like this this doesn't feel like it's just my company anymore. This is our company. This, yeah. and, and I remember, it. I think we had like 10, you know, 10 team members. Uh, and we just started listing, you know, list. I mean, we came up with 50, 60 things. I mean, but there were things that like there, mantras that had been set there, around there, the shop yeah, a lot. Yeah, like mantras know. that, it, exactly. And one of them, you know, one of them was don't believe the hype, mm-hmm. which is our form of you humility, know, humility yeah. staying humble, you know, it's like, it was, you know, we made ours these actionable, you know, you know, things like, like do this, uh, you know, so don't believe the hype. I remember uh, like we would say that all the time, you know, when customers are giving us pats on the back and I was just mm-hmm. like, no, 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 no. Like yeah. we need to, we need to make sure that we're the ones that are thanking the customers. They shouldn't be thanking us, yeah. you know? And that was, that was one of 
those things that just stuck. Um, and that instantly, that instantly became one of the core values. And, and I remember taking those 50, 60 and like really looking at which ones, you know, could be combined with others or were similar and like narrowing it down. And we narrowed it down to 10 and then I added an 11th. Yeah. And then Mike, <laughs> Mike added the 12th. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. Well, what are yours? Okay. I'm gonna throw you under the bus. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I they're do. probably, you have order the thing right, about so, our shop is so, they're probably listed somewhere no, 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 everywhere no, no, you look. They're but. Not, so number one is create and recreate the UCE, the ultimate customer experience. I mean, I think a lot of people in town have seen me do a lot of talks on the UCE. Um, we, we just framed up that customer experience was gonna be number one. Like, and, and it's cool because that one, that one core value in itself has really framed so much of this business and the actions that we take. Um, so it's, that's been vitally important. Number two is stay calm and scoot on, which was probably created for me because, <laughs> <laughs> because like I, I always had a tendency to uh, lose my mind, especially in the younger days of entrepreneurship, specifically like 04 to, how far are you going to go here? <laughs> Before two, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm interested. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I'm still I, losing his mind. I used to, you know, I've, I'm, I'm so much better now, but I used to react to situations. Mm -hmm. You know, I just react to situations. I wouldn't respond. And that's, that core value is, is that. It's like, dude, stay calm. Like, I know this isn't going well, but stay calm. Um, number three is don't believe the hype. Four is uh, embrace and shape change. Five is keep promises. Six is socket to me, which stands for safe, organized, and clean. So we want to maintain a safe, organized, and clean environment. Seven is everybody's favorite. Communicate <laughs> clearly. We have a you know communication is yeah definitely mm -hmm. one of those <laughs> vital uh, and difficult. <laughs> eight is seek awesomeness, which actually came from the the core the core principles S I Q, which is service, integrity, and quality. Um, so we say seek awesomeness. Nine is create a lifestyle. 10, and well, nine is really like, when I look at the business, it was more than just a business and selling scooters. We wanted to create an entire lifestyle around this brand, right? Um, 10 is don't leave your team members hanging. 11 was added by me. So we came up with those 10 and 11 was added by me, which was to serve a higher purpose. So just, you know, very much around your service, mm -hmm. like, hey, like, there's much greater purpose than just selling scooters here. Right. And then I'll let you tell them what 12 is. But. I'm really gonna let me tell you. So 12, 12 actually came from a point where, uh, so I came back to Colin in, in 2013 as a driver. That was the position that he needed. And I had done a lot of different positions in the industry previously, but I had kind of gotten on, on thin ice a little bit with uh, tardiness and stuff. I had kind of been shown the door at the University of Florida and I'd came back and was just looking for something to do. Uh, trying to get my life together. Anyway, um, I, I had had a couple times I was tardy and I had overslept for the service meeting that was required and I felt the guilt just, you know, come over me hardcore and I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe I'm gonna like, Colin, you know, kind of stuck his head out to bring me back on the team. They, I used to work for his business partner. They said, don't bring him back and everything. And I was like, man, I, I, I'm like running out of chances here. So I like went to McDonald's and brought like 50 bucks, 60 bucks worth of breakfast, like sausage, uh, sausage um, muffins and hash browns and everything. And, and I brought it to the team and I was, I'm so, so sorry. Like, you know, I was just embarrassed. And, and he immediately was just like, okay. Like, I mean, like, it was kind of like a, you can't, you can't afford to do that every day. Like you can't just be late and buy 60 yeah. bucks. So he's going to get the point eventually, you know? And it was just kind of like a, that, that felt like, you know, cause you, you get into a position where it's like you, you want to penalize, you want to hold somebody accountable for being late. Right. Um, but sending somebody home for being late gets a little hard on the rest of the yeah. team. Doesn't help. So it's like, what, what is the fair, the fair penalty there? And, and so we came up with core value number 12. If you're late for work, you better bring breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, I, it definitely like, when that happened, and I remember, I'm like, dude, this guy just spent sixty dollars on breakfast when he when he would have been paid the three dollars and fifty cents an hour you're being paid back then. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm like, dang, like, <laughs> you know, the fact that you went out and spent that much was was kind of. But it goes back to things. you know you feel invested in mm -hmm. where you're working, right? So you know. You yeah, I mean, and those and those values they absolutely guide the way we hire. You know, we try to hire. Of course, mm -hmm. we try to hire people who match those values. Um, they help hold us accountable as leaders. They help hold the team accountable. I mean, they've they've definitely been vital. Um, 
You know, I think 12, like I'll be honest, I think 12 is hard to remember for a lot of people. I mean, I got them down, but. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you we're know, still but, but we're quizzing. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, but it was, I mean, I was trying to narrow it down from 60 to, mm -hmm. to 10, you know, so. Um, so it, it worked out and they, they definitely do well. Um, I, yeah, it establishes it your yeah. culture. Exactly. You know, and that's yeah. so important. Exactly. So I just think it's interesting. Uh, you know, I didn't need, mean to go down the whole core value hole, but I just think it's so interesting to hear how your process was very similar to our process. And mm -hmm. I think that's just gonna help a lot of people because I absolutely believe that long term, if you wanna get your company right, like one, we all know that the, co the company culture is everything. Mm -hmm. And that simply comes from the type of people that you hire. And if you have the core values to help make sure that you're hiring the right kind of people and holding absolutely. them accountable, then yeah. then your culture is gonna be healthy as long as, long as you can live up to the core values you know yep. it's funny i i i've seen john spins top talk on the subject of you know having having the best sales guy you know there, there'll be some corporate america company and say oh these are our five values and and then they have some rock star sales guy who is bringing in millions and millions and millions of dollars in sales but he's just a complete asshole to everybody mm -hmm. right and and the core value is you know treat others the way you want to be treated or whatever it is right and, but, <laughs> there's this, but there's this yeah, asshole be... <laughs> but there's this asshole who sells millions and millions and millions yeah. of dollars and no one's willing to go to fire his butt because yeah. he brings in millions and millions of dollars and and that's where that's where shit hits the fan right that's where yeah. that's where things go right so like uh, if you're gonna have core values, live by them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's so important that the leaders that the leadership does as well. So, I don't know, super interesting stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, with I'm really interested with a team of seven, right? How are you as a leader able to like really, um, you know, continue to paint that picture? But really, you know, I, I think. When when I look at team members and and the things that they want, and, you know, they they always they want security, right? And and they want an opportunity for growth, mm -hmm. right? So I think when you have a, a team of seven, sometimes it seems like oh, there's not a lot of opportunity yeah. for growth. I mean, what what are the opportunities for growth? Do you have that laid out? Does somebody come in at like at intern, you know, and then like work their work their way up? And how, you know, is it is it clear as to like how long that can take, what those processes are? Like, is somebody gonna be the next this, president? Like what, you know, yeah. how do you? We had walk? a very long brainstorming session during, the, this was something that came up, again, pretty organically that just kind of happened during one of our culture brainstorming sessions about values and everything is, is what is the you know what does that path look like for somebody that comes into a seven person firm that really only has two job descriptions? There's I mean if you ignore president, which I'm not I don't think I'm going anywhere anytime soon. You have a design engineer like Jose, and then you have a professional engineer who's the one who actually signs the drawings and is is legally responsible for everything. There's really not a a lot of upward mobility. That's that's where a lot of the growth and the personal professional development comes in. We, what came from it was defining basically two kind of pathways, the, an engineering track we called it and more of a personal kind of soft skills track and assigning everybody, you know, here's where you are, here's the tangible steps you can do to get to what we might call like an E1 through an E5 on the engineering track. So you're not necessarily getting a new title, but there are kind of these sub phases of growth where if you're gonna start and you've never designed air conditioning, you don't even know how air conditioning works, we're gonna get you from zero to one over the first year and, and get you familiar with it. And once you've gotten to that level, maybe now you're gonna start attending some meetings, going to the site. You know, When you get to that level of knowledge base, you can up your responsibility level. So it's not really trying to jump to that next promotion for the sake of a title or even the salary. It's building your skill set so you can be more valuable to the team and then everything will follow from that. So what came out of it is really just, we kind of threw the traditional firm hierarchy out the window. It's typically a, a president who's also the principal engineer, some number of professional engineers below them, and each professional engineer has two or three designers under them. That hierarchy is great, but it, it does not allow for upward mobility or individual growth. So what we did was basically say, we only have seven people, let's throw that out. Let's look at what the model should look like. What does our org chart look like if we could start from zero? And, and identify you know, what each individual is great at and maximize 
the yeah. for, you know if you maximize the individual success by identifying what they're good at, you're maximizing your company success. Yeah, we had a fun buzzword during the process. I called it the Jose problem because Jose is <laughs> Jose came from the sales and service side of things, working in retail, and he is great with clients. He's great with customers. He communicates extremely well, but he didn't have an interest in being a PE at the time, and. That, that breaks the mold for the traditional kind of growth pattern for what an engineer should do. But he's an amazing project manager. He's good with the organization, he's great with clients. I want him in the meetings with the clients. But we didn't have, there's no, there's no model for that currently. So we, had, we basically created it. So the project management track will allow him to be a project manager, take on responsibility on the, on the skill set that he really is strongest at without having at the same time to be a professional engineer. Dividing those roles uh, is, was really big for kind of how we recruit. Everybody does not need to you know, want to be a professional engineer and get to that level. Some people are just really good at doing certain things, and we want to be able to optimize those seven people, kind of put them in the right seat you know, to steal from, uh, was that Jim Collins, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so finding a seat for everybody, basically. It's a good book, too. It is, well, it's right over good, there. Good to great, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hold on, I had a question. <laughs> so, uh, so are there? Do you feel like there's any holes in your team right now? Like any any areas that you're missing? Not at the moment. We're pretty well. We hired two people this year. They're both approaching their one year with the company. So we are we are manned up at the moment. Right now, it's it's how do we get the most out of each person, and how do we how do we continue to leverage new technologies, different you know platforms, things like that, to get the most productivity out of us seven before we add anybody new. So that's that's something that I did right from the get-go. When I first took over, you know, you, you get that immediate moment of panic when you realize that six people rely on me for their salary and their paycheck. So the very first thing I did was, how do we minimize overhead, get everything, all of our costs as low as possible, and then we'll start figuring out how do we make more money. So the same approach is I wanna make sure that we are optimizing what we have before we add anything new. So there's, there's still a lot of room for us to grow as we train, new, train the, the two newer guys and, and even some of our more established people start taking on new roles. You know, This year, Jose's taken on more project management, which, which has freed me up to do more on the people management and marketing side. So as that continues to develop and we bring more people on as designers and you know, move the people we have up one rung, as opposed to hiring somebody to fill that gap. So we, we're really trying to just build each person, develop their skill set, kind of build their toolbox so that they can take on more of a responsibility on a project, which removes responsibility from the person above them and allows them to move one step forward. So it's it's been pretty intentional about just slowly increasing everybody's responsibility level as we go. And how many, like, was all of your talent local talent? Or did you guys have to bring we you know? are, it's about 50-50. The two newer grads, or the new hires that we have were both from the Panhandle. Okay. Um, they are not Gators, unfortunately. Mm. But <laughs> <laughs> we won't say where, but the rest of us, I believe, are, are fairly local. Jose, Diego, and I were all graduates here. And, I mean, do you have internships or anything? We do, yeah. Them? We had a summer intern here from UF in the mechanical engineering program. We've had a couple of mechanical engineering interns in the past, always looking for uh, for new interns. Um, they Especially during the kind of the peak seasons, it's very helpful. I also really just, because I didn't get exposed to it, I like exposing people to this industry. Mm -hmm. Just know it exists, and it exists here in Gainesville. Um, I mean, UF is is so heavy on the robotics, the aerospace, the you know Boeing's and Lockheed Martin of the world that I think this industry and kind of the impact and, and the, the fun of it can get lost. Do you think, I mean, I feel like that's just common though. I mean, we've talked about it multiple times, mm -hmm. right? I feel like the university's teaching people how to work for somebody else right? Yeah. versus, I mean, if there were more classes, which it sounds, I mean, you said there's, there are, some there are definitely some more classes, now, yeah. and some entrepreneurial. I mean, in, in heck, when I was in school, they didn't have like entrepreneur, right. yeah. entrepreneurship wasn't degrees a, yeah, or wasn't anything like that, right? Yeah. So the fact yeah. that you're even able to to get to get a degree in entrepreneurship or learn more about you know actually running a business is a step in the right yeah. direction. I, for sure. I really feel, um, especially in the engin uh, electrical engineering program, you know, it's all about those big like Raytheon, TI, all these mm -hmm. big names. You know, Intel I know is a huge recruiter. You know, they take a lot of the talent and um, take it uh, to their headquarters. But 
when you break down, you know, as soon as you graduate and like what you have to, what you're doing, you're, you're, you know, I have a friend that works at Raytheon and he's nowhere near the level of leadership and like, you know, working on the project as, you know, someone, you know, like what we do. Interesting. You know, we have, we have a lot more responsibility up front and we have to learn. And so the technical skills, you know, uh, we're not, uh, it's not that we're not developing the technical skills, but we have the responsibility. You know, we're working with these clients on projects. And so like, that's more of a focus. You have more leadership responsibility as opposed to like someone that's working at Raytheon in your first two or three years, you're just kind of, you know, doing whatever you're told as, as what you were alluding to before. Yeah. Have you guys participated in like one of the local like the UF job fair, they they do one that's like we haven't local. yet. No. Yeah, I mean it's you know I think that's another step in the right direction. Yeah, right? it can be like, a little overwhelming because you are up against every, especially the engineering job fairs and people are just big are names naturally are attracted to the big yeah. names. Yeah. Yeah. Getting a making a dent is is challenging. Hmm. So what made that friend go work for a firm like that rather than a it firm like yours? It was the name. It was the name, and then you 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 know you work so hard, especially electrical engineering. You're just it's kind of miserable sometimes and <laughs> Wait a second, hey I, I get that I mean, we are cool, recruiting man. right now <laughs> um, so, oh my god so you so yeah. terrible I've, I've literally said you know scooters have a way of sucking the soul right out of your life sometimes so uh, I know exactly what you mean so you finally finish this you know this program at school and you know this big company comes and offers you you know a good salary at first right and so you're attracted to that and but you have to like uh uproot your whole life and go to where they are whereas um with us you know you get the you're, you're going to be thrown into like leadership roles almost immediately you know uh you're going to have a lot of uh, time with clients you're going to be involved in the design process pretty early on you know who knows how how far it's going to take you to be involved in a design decision at Raytheon, you know, it's good, it could be 10 years, you know, you're, you're not being, you so don't have it, a lot of. Is it just a, is it a notoriety with a brand and a compensation disadvantage that people would go to a place like that or? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's, it's used as a stepping stone, right? So you, you know, you check that off your resume mm -hmm. and then, you know, then you go to like the next big place and the next big place and where are we developing the local talent to, you know, you know, you don't have to go to big headquarters and, and work there and, you know, check, 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 mm -hmm. come over here, you don't need a check. Yeah. You know, you're gonna be. I think part of it is selling Gainesville as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think Absolutely. it's helpful as more of these big names are, are starting to take plant here. Um, Gainesville is just, that's a tough sell. It historically has been, I mean, that's that was the biggest challenge in getting Jose to stay and, and hang around is that he was from South Florida and it's, you know, it's, it's a tough like, place dude, to get Gainesville's used to. Gainesville's awesome. Yeah. Like what's, I came, I came from an extremely <laughs> small town. So coming yeah. to Gainesville was like, amazing. Right. Where are you right, from? Right, right, right. Like Inverness. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, the, uh, you know, the fact that we can order pizza after 10 PM or go to a movie at midnight, like <laughs> right. that doesn't exist where I was from. <laughs> yeah. So for me, it's great. You know, yeah, I was happy way. to have, yeah. you know, new cuisines. And meanwhile, Jose was saying, well, there's no good Venezuelan place. <laughs> We have you know? Miapa, okay. Right. That's the good, better than I'm from. Dude, the good news is the perception is changing. Yes. I mean, slow, I slow, so. slowly it's but surely, it's, it's definitely come a long way and it's which, changing. Which makes our job easier. You know, the more of these, you know, the more recruiters we have locally, then that's one less thing we have to sell. Now we're just selling ourselves and not just ourselves and Gainesville at the same time. Well, so. and I think like with the internships, I mean, if you're getting people exposed early and they fall in love with the culture, yeah. you know, like, I mean, that, that could be an opportunity. One of the, one of the things that I commonly get asked and maybe you can help with this and you know other Gainesville businesses often ask me you know how how does one go about even you know getting an intern or, you know or connecting with the university in order to get interns I mean like what what steps did you have to take or do you guys just like you know put it on your website or something and they just we, come to you or like they, what typically they've come to us we probably get um, five times as many requests for internship as we can hire. So okay. we, we've had a pretty good um, kind of stream of intern resumes at any time. We do a lot of work with UF and the, and the university, especially with their College of Engineering. We do a lot of their maintenance projects. So our name is, is out there if, if anybody is kind of looking for somewhere to go. The hardest part is, is getting them to look in this direction. You know, a lot of people will do their summer internships at one of those big companies because sure. it, it does add some resume. Um, our goal is to kind of 
is to build the people and to, to get to the point where working for us is something that they want to put on their resume. Um, it's not necessarily the name recognition, but you know, building that skill set, I, I think in three months at our firm, you're going to be given more responsibility and more ability to grow if you embrace it as an intern than you would get at somewhere like a Lockheed Martin or somewhere, one of these big companies where, um, you know, I, like Jose was saying, I've had several friends that go to one of these big companies in their first five years, they're designing a spring. Like their job is this spring that goes in some other super um, assembly and that's their world. With us, you know, in that three month period, you may see this project go start to finish. You know, you may design it, you may be at the initial kickoff meeting and then see it done. And to me, that's the, that's the fun part. You know, we get to see something from zero to 100 mm. 10 times a year. You know, we get, to, we get to be the one that saw it in our mind and then see it actually happen. Yeah. Which is, I mean, when we've gotten people, I think that was kind of the turning point for all of us is when you get to do that for the first time is, is when it really clicks that, you know, the level that doesn't exist at a lot of places to be able, because of the project size we do, it's, it's a timeline that most people can keep their head around. So there's, there's an easy sell there if I can get people to experience it. Cool. We have to wrap up in a minute, uh, but I have one more question. Do you have any more questions? Uh, I've got one I can hang on to for, for the side, side hustle. hustle, yeah. All right, cool. So, uh, 2014 is when you took over, and then shortly, you said that first year, it was really just making payroll. That was the focus, make payroll. And then you said, like the next year, you really started getting out and getting involved, mm-hmm. got involved with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, you know, what's like, it, it, so I, you know, I sit on the chamber board of directors, very involved with the chamber. You see, I've helped out with the, these round tables, trying to get CEOs in, into these little mastermind groups, you know, do a lot of things at the chamber of commerce. And, and I absolutely love the things that they do for the business community. Um, you know, but I constantly hear so many people saying, oh, like, I'm not sure if I'm getting value out of my membership and yada, yada, yada. Um, and I and I tell everybody, I'm like, look, like you have to you have to get out, you have to get involved. If you're going to yeah. pay for the membership, then like use it and like go to events and, and get connected, right? And because the truth is, like, what provides you know what provides value for your business is probably completely different than what provides value for my business, sure, right? So, and and for the chamber of commerce, that's super 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 hard, right? Like maybe chamber after hours is is exactly what you need, but not necessarily what I need, right? So, but. That I think on the macro, they do such a great job of coming up with ways to provide value to all the different businesses here in town. Um, so, so this is my this is one a quick plug for the Chamber of Commerce because I absolutely love the things that they're doing on a macro scale for this community. And I would say get out and get involved and, and be a chamber member. Second, um, what my question <laughs> after all of that <laughs> is like so you know what's the best thing that has happened for you or for your business since you actually you know got outside of the office and started you know networking and building relationships with people th- would, through those events i would say a couple of things number one the networking is fantastic we don't rely a lot on our chamber partners or, or people that I've met through Chamber for direct contact. You know, most people aren't building a building. Most people are not in that, you know, it's a pretty select group of people that are our actual clients, but getting to know what's happening in the community, you know, other businesses that are starting, every business has a lot of the same challenges. You know, everybody's trying to figure out how to use QuickBooks and everything else. So just getting that camaraderie of people who are also going through the same things I was going through at the time, you know, how do you deal with employees? You know, what are your core values? How did you come up with core values? You know, who do you, who do you use for your website? What are you doing on Facebook? All of those things are just invaluable to somebody that came into it and had no idea what they were doing. But beyond that, I think the, the biggest thing, I did a lot of the breakfast before hours. Again, not trying to get leads, but what I found is trying to describe what we do, like we did at the beginning of this, is something that I never, I just took for granted, that people knew what we did. The more I saw blank stares when we tried to extra- describe what we did, the more I realized we have to describe what we do before we can before we can market ourselves. People need to understand why we exist and why they need us before I can try to sell it. Um, so that was the biggest thing I got. Um, getting more involved with the chamber and a lot of the events that they do, I, I think you get what you, you get out what you put in. Um, I mean, there are, the, the dollar value is so, so much more with the chamber than anything else that we're involved with. 
Uh, we've gotten, I mean, 10 times over the amount of value just in, if you went to conferences and the, the lunch and learns that they put on, the ones that you've spoke at, the one, I mean, the speakers they get on a monthly basis for the lunch and learns are fantastic. They do the CEO series. Um, the before hours are great networking opportunities. The after hours are great. Everything that they do, I've, I've, when I've gone, I've never had a bad time and I've never not learned something. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the, the chamber events that uh, the Lunch and Learns they did introduced us to a software platform that is now at the lifeblood of our project scheduling. And that was a free Lunch and Learn, including lunch. I mean, I think it maybe $10 or something to cover lunch that they do. But that was an amazing opportunity for us to learn that that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. You know, I think a lot of times you can operate kind of in your in your window, in your pocket of your industry, but getting above that and meeting people from other industries and hearing the similarities and what they're going through, it, it kind of broadens your perspective that it's not just, you know, we're not unique. That, you know, as entrepreneurs, everybody's kind of fighting the same thing. And even as companies just trying to manage the day-to-day -day scheduling, you know, we found commonality with a real estate company that yeah. was using it. So it's, it's, you know, you wouldn't find that without Chamber, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's the facilitator of all relationships when it, you know, in the business world. And I mean, I've met so many people, you know, at so many events that have led to authentic, real, you know, relationships within the community. And, and so I just think it's extremely valuable. And, and what's funny is like, you know, I look back to the early stages of my business when I was like in my whole, you know, cause I, I go to UF and I speak all the time to the students and, you know, they're asking, hey, if, the, if you could do one thing all over, like if you were gonna go back to the beginning, like what's the one thing that you would do differently, right? And my, and my answer is like, I would get out of my office, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, because I was so in my grind like full, I was behind a computer all day long, you know, do business, 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 business. And the truth was like the, the greatest opportunities were happening outside of the office walls. Mm -hmm. And those are the relationships because the relationships have led to the opportunities, to the deals, to, you know, and, and really just to really great friendships, which yeah. are way better than money anyway. <laughs> it's tough when you're first starting, you feel so overwhelmed and there's not enough time in the day. right? to have the perspective and kind of the just forward looking process enough to say, this networking event is an investment that's going to save me time later. You know, some of the, the relationships that we've built up through the chamber and other things, you know, I could pick up the phone and get something done in five minutes that might've taken two hours had I not known who to call. You know, if I need branded stuff, I know I got five phone numbers I can get and somebody that's gonna get me something in a week where you know, cold calling some company from out of town is gonna take me three weeks and they gotta get my logo right and all this other stuff yeah. where I can, you know, I can pick up the phone and call any number of chamber members that are gonna be able to get what I need pretty quickly. So there's, there's, there's an investment factor to that networking that you're building relationships that will save you time later if you can, if you can appreciate that at the time. There's always something to do that you gotta pull yourself away from to, to build that relationship. So good, man. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to end. So where can our uh, audience find you, connect with you? Well, we just launched a new website. Congrats. Uh, yeah, nice. thank you to Folks Creative for the uh, the work on that. Shout out, um, Brandon West and team. Brandon West. Love um, you guys. It is campbellspellacy.com, and at Facebook, we are at Campbell Spellacy, and we also have LinkedIn. Uh, we're not quite as, as platform heavy as, as some others, but we, we try to do what we <laughs> They're do They're not well. on TikTok. Yeah, I was gonna say, others. look how we have no TikTok. There is no TikTok, there is no Instagram. We could but, change that, I'm yeah. gonna say. <laughs> well, awesome. Thanks again so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, do, we are gonna have side hustles. Man, the side hustles have been really good. Yeah. No, <laughs> I mean, it's like, uh, sometimes I'm like, man, I just wanna like release these. But you guys, like, just remember that, you know, if you subscribe to our Patreon, you get access to the side hustle and then just that's just that little extra money just helps us um, put on this production we appreciate your support so uh, definitely go to patreon.com forward slash whoa GNB and um, that's it for today's episode please you know rate us leave a rating on iTunes or wherever you like to listen oh not rate us but no, like, like rate like you know <laughs> give us give rate us your podcast rate, podcast host rate, yeah, you know um, and <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for listening. This is the WHOA GNV Podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. whoa. We will see you later. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>